The first is someone you might recognize from many previous system administration mini-comps. Simon Lyle is going to talk to us about Prometheus. Hi, how are you going? So um, I'm just talking about scaling Prometheus up and down. Uh, this is for big projects and little projects. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is that Prometheus, I think Prometheus is good for your little pet projects, for your small companies, and for your giant, not quite Google companies. Uh, your definition of small, medium, and big may vary from me. From me, um, As you can see on my resume, I have some biases. I play with Kubernetes and EC2. This will leak into some of my talks and um, I can confirm that DevOps is a job title. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna go very fast through the introduction to Prometheus and then I'm gonna go through the components and scaling up and down the different components, okay? So uh, this is just a quick introduction of Prometheus. So it's about, a, so Prometheus is about metric. So a metric is a name with optional labels, a timestamp when you got it, and a value which is a number. If it's not a number, if it's a big string, it's a log. We don't care. That's for someone else's talk. Um, Prometheus, in its simplest case, is a single daemon. It connects to exporters with an HTTP get. It gets a t uh, lines and lines of values, and it does this every 10 to 15 seconds. You can do it a lot. You can do it more often. I've heard of people doing it every second, and they usually break. Um, people doing it once a minute is a little on the slow side. People checking their metrics every five minutes just are wasting their time. Um, you store it via a local disk and it exports an API and does other things. Um, this is what a label looks like. Uh, it's got a name. It's got a bunch of, uh, sorry, this is what a metric looks like. It's got a name, it's got a bunch of labels, and it's got a value. So all very simple. Uh, that's just the CPU. It's had three and a half million seconds of idle since I booted this machine up. Um, you can do some funny things with labels. This is a not a real metric label. This is how you find out the, what your CPU version is and silly things like that on a machine by hiding them in, inside the rest of it. Um, you can do that. Um, it's normally just special cases like this. Don't go nuts. And this is a query. Um, so just some simple ones. The first one just returns some states. The second one will tell you the number of web servers you have up and running, you hope. And the third one just tells you the number of um, Kubernetes nodes you have in each AWS availability zone. Uh, the third one is relatively on the simple scale. Um, I have personally at work, we use funds about three times as long, and I've seen people with longer ones, but the longer they get, the worse they fail. Um, these things will return either a single metric if you just ask for the last one, or they'll return a whole string. If you go for the single, you're looking at like, hey, is it up or down? If you're looking for a whole series of them, then you may graph it, or you may get a, um, some other trending thing towards that. And that is all the introduction to Prometheus you get. Um, okay, so the bit I'm gonna look at now is getting data into Prometheus. Uh, there's three main ways, you have exporters, so an exporter talks to something else. Uh, a simple case might be a database, so it talks SQL, it talks whatever language your database exports to give it the metrics, number of connections, or sort of it. And then on the other side, it exposes an HTTP endpoint. The HTTP endpoint is what Prometheus talks to. So it's just a bit of middleware that squashes in there, converts a few things. Um, there's about 100 out there. Um, if you go to the Prometheus page, and then if you search around, you'll find there's unofficial ones all over the place. The next one is directly metric apps. Um, this is where the software itself exposes a port. You can connect to it and you can get some Prometheus data. Um, this isn't that common. It's very common in the Kubernetes namespace. Most of the Kubernetes things have them. Uh, there's not much else. There's traffic, which is a load balancer does it, uh, Grafana itself. So if you talk to Grafana on a random port, it'll tell you the number of connections that are happening right now. Um, and if you are a software shop or a web shop or whatever you're writing, you should, that you want to monitor, you should uh, perhaps put um, metrics in your own app as, long, as well as logs. So 
you know, if you're running our big a little website like I am at work, um, we have microservices and a large number of the microservices, not all of them, have uh, libraries and these just expose metrics by default. And so we can actually talk to them at that level. So what you end up with is lots of layers of metrics. So this is an example. This is close to what I have at work. Um, other people may have more or less. So, and we, yeah, so we get the same stats. We get metrics on many layers of the stack. So at the bottom, you have CloudWatch. So we're running EC2, we talk to EC2 and we say, oh, how's, how many nodes are up and all this sort of crap. And where are they and what are they doing and what state are they in? And then we go and we t talk to Node Exporter, which is just a thing that runs it on every machine. It tells you the CPU, it tells you the RAM, it tells you the disk, it tells you every network interface, how many IPv6 packets it dropped last week, crap like that. Uh, Kubelet is part of uh, Kubernetes. It, it does native stats. CA Advisor does container stats. KubeState Metrics is what Kubernetes thinks everything's running at, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's another page. <laughs> and the, the X page is JMX, which is an interface to the JVM. So that returns stats on the JVM. It returns stats on the application within the JVM. Depends how you configure it. The applications, like I said, are of our own are directly exposed, then you have even more because you have a service mesh between. So your network stack between your things, you're grabbing numbers off them, and then you've got load balancers, you're grabbing numbers off them, you're talking, then you have black box, so you connect to the port on something, so you connect to port 80, and it takes you 200 milliseconds, that's another stat. Then you have, in our case, you have microservices, and we have this microservice here and here, connecting to these ones here, and this one says it takes, you know, two seconds. So that's a stat, that two second stat that this guy said should be attached to this one and say this one's guy's taking two seconds to process those requests. So you've got to correlate them all together and you end up with a mess. Um, so you end up with thousands of metrics per server. At the minimum, if you just install Node Exporter, which is just a CPU disk and et cetera on the thing, you get about six to 800 off a boring, simple VM. And you are pulling down all those every 15 seconds. So you get a ton of metrics. If you, you know, you have a little web farm, you know, 50 servers, and nothing else. You could be doing 100,000 metrics just like that very quickly. Every 15 seconds grows very fast. If you have overlapping metrics like I did before, they're hard to correlate with each other. Everything has a different View, slightly different view of what memory is and how much memory something uses because they're measuring at a different layer in the stack. They also call things differently. So um, some things will call a VM an instance, some will call it a node. You have pods versus containers, all sorts of layers. It's quite hard to correlate. It's hard work. Um, some, some sources are costly to talk to. So you have uh, CloudWatch um, charges you 0 0.001 stats uh, per stat to grab. Unfortunately, if you grab eight, a few hundred every 15 seconds for a few month, for a month, that's serious money. Hundreds of dollars. You can get $100 CloudWatch bills without even trying. You can get $10,000 CloudWatch bills with very simply. Um, Another problem is uh, you have code and apps that aren't instrumented and you can't instrument because, hey, we didn't write it with instrumentation and if you go to the code group and ask them, they say, well, you know, put it on our backlog and maybe next year or the year after. Um, so this is what I recommend, Laz. If you're small, like, so small, home, slightly bigger than home, or, you know, my minimal, minimal vial product, just use the standard exporters. Use the node exporter, your D, one for your DB, black box to pro, probe the edge. There's a part of the node exporter is a text files exporter. So you just um, have a directory, you dump a file in there that's got, basically in Kubernetes format, it's just got metric and a number, and it'll just say, oh, okay, that, and it'll just export that as well. So I do that, I use that for dumb things in my home setup. I have the thing that keeps the count of how many browser tabs I have open and how many windows I have open and how many emails I have and 
crap like that. You just write a little shell script or a little whatever script that just grabs these numbers and just outputs it. It's very simple. Do it every few minutes. If you're a bit bigger, um, you'll be using standard exporters, but you'll be having lots of them. So you'll be running, you know, that group of servers, that group of servers, that group of servers. And so each of them will have many exporters on. It's a lot to keep track of. Use the text file. If you have another monitoring system, there's gateways between it. You can query collect the pull numbers out, things like that. If you're large, you should be instrumenting your code because you don't really care about the low level stuff. You care about what your code's doing, what your service is doing. Um, you, yeah, the um, infrastructure should be taking care of itself largely. Um, there's a thing called federation uh, to uh, basically, you have one Prometheus over here, pulls a ton of data from your data, one this data center, and this one over here in the central one just pulls a sample of that or a portion of that. That's if you've got a huge amount of data and you just don't want to be querying, querying across, you know, 10,000 servers just to find the load or something when just a sample out of it would work. Um, what do we got next? Next one up, service discovery. Um, so this is just to basically find a bunch of servers. So there's three standard methods. You can just shove, shove. If you're a traditional place and your servers never change, just put them in the config. Don't worry about it. Um, Next one is there's a bunch of standard discovery things. So there's EC2, it goes off to EC2 and says what instances are running. Filters those and then says, okay, there's an instance there, all right, I'll connect to it and see if the node exporter is giving me stats and all this sort of thing. Just automatic, works off the shelf, this much config, well, this much boilerplate with config that you copy over and over and over again. Uh, similar OpenStack, Kubernetes, whatever, if you don't have an auto discovery that's built into Prometheus, there's a file based one. It just goes off, samples the file, and says, Give me a list of servers, and you have some other third, third party process out there, writes to that, keeps things up to date. Um, so if you're a small site, use static config, simple auto discovery, you probably, you know, you're on EC2, you're running a bunch of servers, use those. Just have an EC. If you're medium, Basically, the more complicated, the larger you get, the more varied sort of things you are, uh, the more spread out. You're gonna have to template your auto discovery. You're gonna have to have groups. You're gonna have to have complicated things. And you shouldn't be staticizing everything. You'll have ones where you have to create a template, service discovery for this machine, Prometheus instance over here and that. It just gets more and more complicated as you go. And you want to automate it and template it and codify it as soon as possible. Or as soon as, as, soon as it saves enough. Um, this is alerting. I'm not going to go into details on alerting rules. Alerting rules are complicated. Um, they're also really hard to find good ones. You go out there and you say, oh, show me a bunch of alerting rules. And they're in someone's GitHub. And you go through and you go, oh, there's 50 alerting rules. They look OK. And you grab it, and hopefully it'll tell you when your disk runs out, or your uh, some your cluster falls over, or something. And maybe they'll work, and maybe they won't. Uh, there's a ton of gotchas. Um, so I'm not actually going to go into alerting rules itself. If someone wants to do a talk next year about them, um, maybe they could. <laughs> not me. Um, so this is some just some general about alerting and that. Um, so you end up with Prometheus. You got some alerting rules, and then you have an alert manager you send the data to. Um, you can have multiple alert managers for redundancy, I guess. Um, you should as you get bigger, just in case. Don't want it to fall over. There's a thing called an AM tool for alert manager tool. That's a nice way of talking to it. You can pull out the list of current alerts. You can say, ignore this alert. You can pl play around with your config all the time. There's lots of good little tricks. They're slowly improving that with every release, so try and get an up-to-date one. Um, Prometheus releases are fairly um, common. Uh, there's a thing called silences. Um, therefore, basically in maintenance, it says ignore this alert um, or something like that. Uh, they get more and more useful the bigger you get. Um, also the same with labels. Um, so if you're little, you don't care. You, they're just alerts, they just go to you. If you're bigger, you're gonna have a web team, a dev team, a a couple of operations teams. You want to make sure the right team's alerted, and you want to make sure the importance of labels is on alerts. So 
you have to start doing that. You have to create rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, stuff coming out. If you're small, Slack, email, I guess. Um, the trouble with those is if you miss it, bad luck. Your web server's over, and you you know you weren't looking at Slack at that time. Um, the next ones up are the incident management vendors, so the PagerDuty type of people. Uh, at the bottom end, some give out free accounts. Uh, PagerTree and OpsGenie, I believe, have free accounts with less than a couple of users. Um, at the top end, you're paying $50 per month per user, US. Um, so they're enterprise level sort of things. Um, if you need the features, need the reporting features, you know, you'll know. Okay. Um, another thing to worry about is low priority alerts. So the wake me up in the middle of the night alerts, they're easy because all they have to do is get to you somehow and wake you up. Um, something that's, hey, this machine's going to run out of this space in a week or this cert's going to expire in, two in three weeks' time, what do you do with those? You don't want those waking you up at 2 a.m. Um, so you can schedule alerts for office hours if you shove them into pager duty. By default, I'll just say pager duty as a default vendor. Um, they they can do off peak scheduling, on peak scheduling, things like that. Um, everyone I've seen said avoid email. People just if you stream hundreds of alerts a day, people will put in a put in a folder and never see it. Um, yeah, this isn't a solved problem. You could create tickets. You could send it to a Slack group. You could have it to a dashboard. Those things will scale to 20 a day. Um, Above that, I don't know. There isn't, isn't a solved problem. Um, so, a bit of a summary. So, if you're small, just send your, send your on-call, yourself, everything. If you're medium, start prioritizing high priority, low priority. If you're a big guy, um, you have multiple groups, multiple levels, you've got to prioritizing automating fixes. So, yeah, you shouldn't. You have to put in serious solutions at the top. Uh, storage, um, so the problem with this is, like I said, you're generating thousands of metrics a minute, thousands of seconds. It's, it's trivially, trivially easy, <laughs> easy. <laughs> sorry, to have 10,000 metrics a second. And you can't just shove that in MySQL. MySQL falls over and dies. Um, so the default, um, Default TSDB that comes from Prometheus is great. It can handle lots of writes. It can handle lots of reads. The only trouble is it's a disks in a directory, and it isn't redundant. And if it gets corrupt, you're out of luck. And it's you can back it up, but that's about all. And once you run out, of, your disk runs out of speed, you're out of luck. Or if things get too big, you're out of luck. Um, there are some replacements. Uh, they are complicated, clustered databases and they are all fairly new in the last year and hard to run. Uh, so for a small site, um, just use the local thing, back it up, roll back in the event of an outage and hey, if you lose a few hours of graphs, you should be okay. Uh, medium sites, they actually advise running two instances, they're grabbing the same data because it doesn't matter, it's all pull and if this guy dies, we'll just pull off here and reef backfill this, and if we keep two weeks of data, we hope that this guy's this guy stays up two weeks before, two weeks, so this guy can completely fill up in time. I didn't break that. <laughs> if you're a large site, um, look at the external clustered stuff. Um, the ones there are Thanos, M3, and FluxDB. Thanos has uh, got announced about six months ago, and everyone went, "Cool, this looks cool," and yeah, well. You know, if you've got time, try it. Multiple nodes, clustered file systems, what can go wrong? Um, and use federation to reduce the amount of stuff you actually have to keep. Uh, so once again, not a fully solved solution here. Um, so display um, of your stuff. Uh, so there's a built-in dashboard that comes with Prometheus. Um, it's good enough to play around. Um, there's an API, which everything else talks to. Um, so as far as I can tell, the only thing that actually talks to it is Grafana. 
Um, there may be a bunch of other tools that pull data out of it, but I haven't run into them, and I Googled a bit for this talk and couldn't find much. Um, and so it means if Grafana doesn't do it, you're out of luck. So like I said, if your server exports a string of things and you want to find the cool stuff, I don't know what to do. Um, you might be out of luck there. Uh, so Grafana is the best option. Um, it's pretty good. As a, it's got a Prometheus start source. It's all pretty good. Well tested, smart things, and it also even talks to alert manager to graph your alerts and put them in a hash, things like that. Uh, the bad things about Grafana is there are um, 800 publicly shared dashboards that use Prometheus, and most of them are crap. Uh, uh, people just shove them out. They download another one, re-upload it again with a new name. It's, some of them are awful. Some of them are buggy. A lot of them are broken when things changed. Um, the scary ones is I download and point it at my cluster. It's going, hey, reload cluster stats, reload cluster stats against a giant cluster, a big cluster of machines, and my browser falls over, and then my Prometheus almost falls over trying to get all these queries. Um, and yeah. It's pretty obvious, you just pick the ones with lots of downloads, but they're not great. So this is what they look like, the bad ones. Um, most of the time I get it, it says free, I'm using 300% CPU. So, but that's quite common when you try one out. Um, the fix seems to be uh, just download and try them. I downloaded about 50 for Kubernetes and Prometheus, trying to find the good ones. And yeah, just download them, look through them. <laughs> Yeah, but you find the good metrics. So this is a sample one I downloaded. I went, hey, these guys look good. It's got some zeros. So this is just the Kubernetes API. So I got this, played around with it, and I got that. And that's my current one at work. You see, this is a nice little pod, so everything's up. A nice little cluster, so everything's up and running. And we just have that one. Um, so I've got, I've got a few minutes. So another thing is arranging dashboards. So got overview dashboards. Good show summaries, drill down dashboards, and that's just for going over data, trying to find a thing, pointing at one little thing and trying to find a problem. So here's a sample drill down dashboard. This is just going against one microservice. It's got load, connections, memory, pods, and another one pointing at one database. Um, unsolved in this area, like I said, you're grabbing hundreds of metrics, you can't display them all anywhere. Um, you don't even know what metrics you're looking for. There's lots of stuff. You will get a bunch of SaaS vendors saying, hey, look, we have AI and we can find the important stuff and all that. And some of them are better. Some of them sort of do that. Maybe we need that in the open source space. Uh, overall, so for display, just use the pre-builts if you're a little guy and Grafana. Medium, you'll do the pre-builts. Big, you'll just have to roll your own and play around and get things to work and automatically create dashboards to do one for each of your 50 clusters, which you will need to do. Um, an extra, um, I don't have time to talk to this. Google these, read metrics, use metrics. This is a way of looking at metrics and things, finding the important stuff, not worrying about random, the, the other 600 metrics that your service is doing. Uh, and this is self-monitoring. So this is if your Kubernetes falls over, something's connecting it to it from the outside, and it will tell you in the middle of the night your, Kube, uh, sorry, your Prometheus has fallen over. I flip the word sometimes. All right, uh, overall summary. Yeah, overall summary. If you're a small site, just run a single instance, configure everything you get, back it up, fail over, fail over use the cheap stuff, Minimal exporters, try and keep it really simple. Um, you know, it shouldn't be a full time job or anything like that. Medium site, sites and duplication, redundancy, build stuff automatically, try the backing up your data, see if you get lucky. Um, use PagerDuty or whatever. Um, start instrumenting more and more stuff all the way through your stack. Another, another 100,000 metrics never hurt anybody. And so one day someone will come along and they'll want them. Something will break in the middle of the night and you'll find that that metric told you what it was. And large site, uh, you've got 
you're going to have to score, you're going to have to have multiple Prometheus instances, it's pointing at little bits of your thing, redundant, or whatever. It's going to be complicated, um, but you're a big site, you can handle it. Uh, you're going to have a lot of templating, auto discovery. Um, look at the clustered storage ideas, see if you can get them to work. Um, you'll have to be using PagerDuty sort of things, and um, start chopping. Start actually keeping less because yeah. If you're that big, you don't really care about stats on every little virtual interface. And that is me. Thank you. Got time for questions? Got time for questions? Okay. So I got a little bit of time for questions. Yeah. We can take a couple of questions while Hamish is sitting up for the final talk. Right at the back. <laughs> Would you believe I blur it point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, question. Yep. Do you think instead of a cl cluster of servers, this could be used to monitor IoT and devices spread around the world? Um, it's a little hard on IoT because it goes out and connects to the end device. So you, if you've got, yeah, it doesn't work as well. You need IoT. You normally IoT would be pushing from each device into somewhere. Um, so you, there are gateways that will handle that, but it's not, it's not the okay. model that's really designed. So, it's yeah. uh, so this is basically pulling architecture, pulling all the servers. Yeah, surface. so it connects okay. to the device and pulls it down. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so you can use a push gateway or things to flip them around, but it's not native. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, I've, I've got a quick question. Over here? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, at, at work we use the, pretty much the previous version of this, Munin, and Munin's got this really weird <laughs> feature where basically it, it takes like a fixed set of samples and then takes lower resolution copies of that so you, you, you can get sort of a lower resolution look back at a much longer time. And um, you said this is like cuts off after two weeks, do you have something for like long range trends? So Thanos, uh, so what you can do is with the Federation you can pull off uh, lower, older samples and that. Um, it is only about one byte per sample, so it's not that hard to keep months and months and months of that. Um, and things like Thanos will also down, down sample as well, um, but yeah, there's a lot of work to get to them. Um, I think that's probably me. Thank you.